Good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of Millim to this evening's presentation. Welcome wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. Our series of online talks and conversations continues with our guest this evening, Martin Sugarman, and I'll introduce Martin in just a moment. A couple of points of housekeeping first. Please do ask questions. You can do this by typing whatever you'd like to ask into the Q&A facility on your screen. And as ever, we will do our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. Let me also draw your attention to the chat facility. This will allow you to send a message to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. This event is being recorded and it will appear on our website at millim.org.uk in the next day or so. Uh, on our website, you'll also find recordings of other past events and details of our future programme for which you can book tickets. Uh, as to our guest this evening, Martin Sugarman was born in Hackney and is a graduate of Bristol University. He is an author and is the archivist for AJEX, the Jewish Military Association. He previously worked as an examination officer and senior teacher, and he's written several books about the Jewish contribution to the Second World War. Martin, it's a pleasure to uh, have you as our guest. A very warm Milim welcome to you. And without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Turn your sound up if you can't. Turn your phones off. Might be a good idea. I made that mistake once. Um, just over a hundred years ago, the Turkish Empire made the mistake of siding with the Central Powers in the First World War. And this led to a very momentous event in Jewish history as an unintended consequence. The formation of the Zion Mill Corps, who fought at Gallipoli, and the Jewish Legion, who fought in Israel. And these were the first Jewish fighting forces with their own flag and badges to fight as a Jewish unit in 2000 years since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So on the question of participation in World War I, many of you will know about the British Jewry Book of Honor. Over 60,000 British and Commonwealth Jews served in the First World War on the Allied side and well over 3,500 were killed. We're still finding new names, by the way, by, because of people who hid their identities. Among them was Lieutenant Marcus Siegel of the King's Liverpool Regiment, who letters, over 50 of them, we came into possession of many years ago when his sister died and the letters were passed over to us. She'd had them secretly stored in her loft. These letters give her an incredible account as only an officer could write, uncensored virtually, of the world of the trenches. Some of the letters are very funny, like uh, the one where he tells his mother to stop sending fresh chicken because the last one she did send when they opened the box, it jumped out and walked around the trench. It was so high. Uh, others very uh, uplifting where he gets seconded to an RAF, uh, a Royal French Air Force squadron and is astonished at the number of French Jews who are flying frontline aircraft. So the First World War, a momentous occasion. Five VCs, a sixth VC if you count David Hirsch, I do. And if we look at the other side, 100,000 German Jews fighting for the Kaiser, 12,000 of whom were killed, an astonishing number. And among them was Lieutenant Hugo Gutmann, who has the unfortunate honor of going down in history as the man who recommended a corporal in his platoon for the Iron Cross. And you're probably ahead of me. He was, of course, Adolf Hitler. My talk this evening is on something that happened not in France or in the Middle East, it happened in London. And I'm gonna keep it fairly short because you can read the very detailed account that I've written on the Jewish Virtual Library, which you just Google and put in March of the Jewish Legion in Whitechapel and it will come up. It was also published in the Stand 2 magazine of the Western Front Association about 15 years ago. But what you won't get in either of those are the film, the song, and many of the illustrations, which I'm gonna show you this evening. So without further ado, let's get on to the topic. So in 1917, 
after three years of lobbying by both the British Jewish community and its many friends in the wider community, the British government agreed to raising a specifically Jewish unit to fight in the British army in World War I against the Turks in Israel. It was a momentous and iconic moment in Jewish history. And only, as I said, the second time since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the loss of Jewish statehood, that an independent Jewish fighting unit had been formed with its own banners and cap badges, uh, the famous menorah badge, a picture of which I'll show you later on. The force was to be part of the Royal Fusiliers and they were given the battalion numbers 38, 39 and 40 with the 41st and 2nd battalions in reserve. The whole force became known as the Jewish Legion or colloquially as the First Judeans. The Guardian newspaper even alluded to them as the New Maccabeans. To the Jewish community, they were known endearingly as the Royal Jusaliers or the King's Own Schneiders because so many of them were tailors. And these names quickly attached themselves to this astonishing group of what we would now call war heroes. They even had a mock motto, no advance without security. Quite famous Jews joined this battalion, the 38th Battalion, including, for example, the sculptor Jacob Epstein, and I'll say something more about that uh, later on. And another one was Vladimir Jabotinsky, the famous revisionist Zionist, who the British soldiers called Captain Jugger Whiskey because they couldn't pronounce his name. He was an honorary officer in the 38th Battalion. The 39th Battalion, the 38th were raised mainly in London, that consisted of uh, men from all over Britain, from Manchester and Leeds and so on. 39th Battalion were raised mainly in America and Canada, and some came from Argentina. And the 40th Battalion were mostly Israeli Jews, uh, refugees from the Turkish occupation of what was to become Israel. And they included people like David Ben-Gurion, Levi Eshkol, and Yitzhak ben -Zvi. Quite a lot of books have been written about the Legion, a lot of them in Hebrew and not translated. Uh, if you look at my article online, there is a bibliography of all the books I've found about them. And if you want to continue to find out about their history outside of Britain, you can simply use the bibliography that will guide you. Um, they marched through Whitechapel and the city of London on Monday, February the 4th, 1918, watched, watched proudly by a wild and frenzied cheering crowd of East London Jews, because they were on their way to liberate Israel for the Jewish people. The Times described how half the battalion, consisting of four companies totaling about 450 men, with 12 officers, had been ordered to London by General McCready, who was the adjutant general of the armed forces from their training camp in Plymouth, at a place called Egg Buckland, which is a Plymouth, a Plymouth suburb. I was there recently, actually on holiday, and you can go and visit the place where they trained. And they were to parade through sit the city of London and Whitechapel and did so marching through the streets, quote, amid scenes of enthusiasm along the whole of the route. Men whose sturdy physique and martial bearing were favorably commented on and heartily welcomed, not just by the Jewish inhabitants. Traffic was halted and shouts of welcome came from the offices of the city of London or from the tops of buses. When the men were marching through the East End, this led to the famous, probably apocryphal story of the elderly Jewish lady who was watching her son march by and she turned around and said to a very pucker Englishman, look at my son Moshe, he's the only one marching in step. Now, while you're laughing, I'm going to say, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not. I like to think it's a true story. The men were commanded by Colonel John Patterson, DSO, the fire, fiery Judeophile Irish Protestant from the county of Lachern near Dublin in Ireland, where he was born. The men had slept overnight at the Tower of London and at 10 a.m., some sources say 11 a.m., after an early morning inspection, they emerged from the Tower of London in columns of four abreast, carrying what we would now call the Israeli flag, it was then known as the Zionist flag, and Union Jacks held high aloft, led by a very large band of about 50 men of the Coldstream Guards. 
there was a huge amount of cheering. They made their way in damp weather up the Minories, where my grandmother was living at the time, to Aldgate, and then onto Fenchurch Street and Lombard Street to Mansion House. And some of the newspapers I looked at, and it's the newspapers which are the only source of this, because nothing is written in the books about this incident because it was before they left Britain. And the war diaries of regiments don't start until they get into the theatre of war. So other, other roads that were mentioned in some of the press were Threadneedle Street and Bishopsgate, but they're all very close by anyway, and it's highly likely that they marched around those thoroughfares as well. With Colonel Patterson at the front, who'd also commanded the Zion Mule Corps at Gallipoli two years before, the men were in full service kit with packs, and they had helmets slung behind them, and they were permitted to march with fixed bayonets, a special privilege granted very rarely to any British unit. This goes back to medieval times when having an army unit outside your town and then come into your town was a bit of a risk because of the misbehavior, drunkenness and so on. And as a sign that the city fathers had given permission for the Jewish Legion to march through the city of London, they were allowed to march with fixed bayonets. And you will see in a photograph later, a photograph that was hidden for over a hundred years, which I discovered in the newspaper archives years ago at Collindale. Um, you'll see them marching proudly with their fixed bayonets. Patterson is seen on his horse laughing, bowing to the crowd, wearing a rose which a girl had thrown to him from the balcony. And off they went, uh, marching through the capital. The most famous photograph of the men on their march shows Patterson clearly at the head of the men on his horse with one of his officers mounted behind him. Although the image is slightly blurred, it does appear in many books on the First World War. Every man seems to be smiling as the crowd were cheering them. On the film, you'll see the officers with their swagger sticks and their swords. One is wearing a great coat, evidence of how cold and wet the day was. And the crowd is absolutely huge. It's rows and rows of people standing up by the pavement, some of them pushed onto the roads, watching the march by. At the mansion house, the Lord Mayor, Sir Horace Brooks Marshall, and loads of dignitaries were on the balcony saluting the regiment, and they wheeled around in order to turn back to make their way back towards the East End. Those of you who know London will know this is quite a long way to march. The Jewish Chronicle said he must be a dull and imaginative Jew who without a glow of emotion or pride could have witnessed London's welcome to the Judeans as they marched through the streets of the metropolis, trampling down in their progress all the foolish fears and fictions of those leaders in Israel, meaning Jews everywhere, who frowned originally on the idea of a Jewish regiment and tried to spoil it. Looking each of these men in the eye, every inch a soldier, a hundred well-spun fables about the Jews have been blown into nothingness. The Judeans are a living refutation of many a silly legend that have clung to the name of Jew, and the cheers of the London people testify that the whole edifice of calumny and ignorance, the work of centuries of anti-Semitism, has been toppled to the dust. There were lots of... Um, remarks like this in the press, which gave a very favorable description of what the Jewish soldiers were doing. From the mansion house, then they turned up towards Cornhill and Leavenhill Street, towards Allgate, and they went down to what was the Pavilion Theatre in Mile End Road, which actually stood at 193 Whitechapel Road on the corner of Valence Road. You can go and visit the site today. As the sound of the band brought masses of the people to the main road around Aldgate, people were shouting, Baruch Abba, welcome, and come back for Shalom, come home in peace, in Hebrew and in English. Mothers wept and handed little parcels to their sons if they recognized them marching by. Fathers called out last words to their boys. The Star, now a defunct newspaper, described how one feat in one feature that gave great pleasure to the crowds was when the guards band played the Hatikva, now as the Jewish national anthem of Israel, of course. 
The Daily Mail described the men as soldierly with spick and span appearance. But it wasn't until the battalion got in the midst with the Union Jack and Zionist flags of pale blue and white, swung into Mile End Road past Allgate East Station, that the enthusiasm reached a peak. They were now on home soil. Most of the men lived around here, but hadn't been home for months, of course, training in, down in Plymouth. And many Jews, religious and non-religious, men and women, were all standing on the footpath's edge for a close glimpse of their own men. After a short time, the men marched on via Jubilee Street and turned back west on Commercial Road towards Camperdown House. Now, Camperdown House uh, was the headquarters of the Jewish Ladge Brigade, very near Allgate East Station. The whole area of housing there has been long demolished and has been replaced by modern buildings. But one of the office blocks is still, still called Camperdown in memory of the building which was specially purpose built for the Jewish Lads Brigade, now the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade, of course. And here the men lined up and were inspected by Lieutenant General Sir Francis Lloyd, who commanded the London region and were drawn up in Alley Street, which has also now disappeared. Young women hang out of windows, hundreds of Jews responded to the cries of attention and were thrilled as the men stood smartly together. In his speech outside the hall, General Lloyd complimented the men on their military appearance and went on to say that this was not by any means the first effort of the great Jewish population of Britain and the empire in defense of the Western Alliance. I feel sure, he said, you will prove worthy followers of the ancient Jewish warriors for the glory of the Jewish nation. And he wished, wished them Godspeed. The men then fell out at 1.30 in the afternoon and had a kosher lunch at Camperdown House, which was decorated inside and out with Zionist flags and colors of the allied nations. And across the large dining room in bold Hebrew characters was the motto, the land of Israel for the people of Israel. We even know what they had to eat. There was a menu. It consisted of soup, beef pie, apple pie, coffee, fruit and cigarettes. Joseph Cowan, the leading Zionist, presided and many other prominent Jews were present, including Lieutenant Jabotinsky, as I mentioned. Grace was recited by the Reverend Solomon Lipson, who was Jewish chaplain, one of the Jewish chaplains to the forces. And Cowan again blessed the men, muzzle and bracha, and hoped that they would return in peace. Colonel Patterson, of course, responded to the toast and with the Lord Mayor of Stepney present, acknowledged the good work of the Ladies' Comfort Committee. And then he went on to speak with great affection about the men he had trained. He said, what has come forth is not a mouse, but the Lion of Judah. And you can see the lion's whelps all around you. I am confident that all the members of the regiment will equip themselves like men. Their training has been beyond all praise. There was only one problem. There weren't enough of them. His passionate words resonating with biblical undertones. He said he wanted not thousands, but tens of thousands. He said that the men would fight together and in some case may even die together. But what we do know is that we shall all work together and we shall march on to victory. You are a fine and hard, well-disciplined lot. And I mean that you will give good account of yourselves, whatever duty is assigned to you. The Chief Rabbi Joseph Hertz then gave his benediction to the men and said that every Jewish soldier held the honor of his people in his hand. They would be, he said, worthy successors of the ancient warrior, the warriors of the Jewish, of the Bible, the Maccabeans. The response was deafening. He reminded them that in this great struggle, British ideals were consistent with Jewish ideals. And he quoted from the Psalms saying, the guardian of Israel who slumbers not, nor does he sleep, will have you all in his keeping. God save the king. And then they sang the Hatikva and the national anthem. After the lunch, the troops were marched uh, down to order outside the building and accompanied by the band of the Coldstream Guards, they entrained marching all the way to Waterloo Station, quite a long journey. And from Waterloo, they were to go to Southampton Docks 
where they met up with the second half of the battalion and they were then going to leave for France on their way to the Middle East. The men were decorated with the flowers from the tables at Camperdown House. There was a safer Torah, Torah scroll at the head of the procession that had been given by Captain and Mrs. Israel Fredman. The Reverend Lipson had presented it to the troops and he said very movingly, I give into your keeping this book of the law to be in all circumstances and at all times your never failing guide. In the remote past, the law went forth from Zion. Happy are you, you are taking it to Zion to establish and re-establish our sacred land. And as the troops marched, marched away, many religious Jews lining the route manifested their traditional respect to the scroll as it was carried ahead of the marching columns of men. Strong stuff indeed, I wish I, wish I could have been there. One unnamed cynic writing in the Jewish Chronicle described how the um, Zionist flag, today's Israeli flag, was the last thing he saw as the train left Waterloo Station to the lusty farewells of the men amid the tears of waving relatives. Tributes flowed in in the press the following day. Lord Mayors of Stepney and the city wrote to Lord Rothschild saying how much pleasure they had had in taking the salute and many other um, tributes followed in the press. Patterson himself wrote in the Jewish Chronicle that week, this march of the Jewish soldiers unique in English history proved a brilliant success. The scenes of enthusiasm rocked with fervor. The people roared to welcome their own and Jewish banners were hung everywhere. Now, as you would expect, there was a little bit of bile that was flowing. Um, the East London Observer stated that the military authorities are to be congratulated on deciding not to give the battalion a distinctive Jewish title or a Shield of David badge. Well, in fact, he got that wrong, as I'll show later. Uh, he called them our own Judeans. And he said that the formation of these men was under circumstances quite peculiar for Britain. And there was obvious advantage, kind of backhanded compliment from a recruiting point of view. The men did bear themselves bravely, he said it patronizingly, and in large measure assimilated some of the best traditions of Tommy Atkins. They go, he said, to meet the infidel Turks who have long been the tyrants of Jerusalem. This was quoted in the Jewish world. The Jewish Chronicle also noted on the 22nd of February that the tongue of malice is we know impossible to restrain. Even though every man was a volunteer, a rumor had spread that numbers of them had actually used the march in order to desert. Nothing could be more reprehensible, said the Jewish Chronicle, than this absolutely unmitigated falsehood. So there was the usual anti-Jewish feeling, like the media today, don't believe everything you hear. Such was the anti-Semitism of the time. In total, the battalion marched about eight miles that day, including from the tower to the city, to the East End, to Waterloo. And from Southampton, they sailed on the SS Antrim to Cherbourg, and then by train to Lyon in Southern France and then to Egypt. We should remember that this was a very significant day in Jewish history. It's too easy for Jewish people today, living in a country where we enjoy freedom and in a world where Israel is strong and well-established, to forget how astonishing it must have been, how hugely symbolic for Jews who had fled persecution in Europe in many cases, to reach freedom in Britain and then witness a Jewish regiment going off to fight to liberate Israel. And it all happened in Whitechapel. Now some final notes, the 38th Battalion, and remember only half of them were marching on that day, were awarded during the fighting in Israel and in Sinai. One DSO, five military crosses, three of them with bars, that means two to the MCs, to the officers, one Distinguished Conduct Medal, six military medals, and eight mentions in dispatch for bravery to the other ranks. One officer and 31 men were killed and several wounded. Numbers are not really known. Now, I'm going to 
just remind you also that quite a lot of famous people served in the Jewish Legion. Um, Yitzhak ben Zvi, the second Israeli president, Yaakov Dori, who was the first chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces in 1948, Jacob Epstein, I mentioned, the British sculptor, although he didn't go abroad with them, he was sick, Levi Eshkol, the third Israeli prime minister, Eliyahu Golem, the founder of the Haganah, and a man called David Grun, really David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, and many, many others. Um, were members of the Jewish Legion. I'm going to ask um, the host to show the slides and I'm going to talk to the slides and then hopefully there'll be time for questions. So shall we move on to the first one? Right, this is the famous picture that you'll see um, in many of the books. There's Patterson at the front, uh, deputy commander behind him. You'll see the great coat being worn by the officer marching with the swagger stick and behind are the men with uh, their bayonets fixed and in front you can see the band. The picture of the crowd behind gives you an idea of the, the numbers who were watching. Next slide. This is the one I found in the Daily Mail. Um, this would have been about 10 years ago and it hadn't seen the light of day in any book that I've ever read about them and you can see those lovely Jewish faces if you look just above the um, butt of the rifle, you'll see a what is in fact um, canvas uh, wrappings that go around the trigger mechanism of the rifle. And this is a sure sign that they're going off to the front. This is to protect the mechanism from, um, from the weather. Look at the guy on the far left. And the Second guy along, if you look at the top of the rifle, you'll see the handle of the bayonet, which is fixed and behind a slightly better view. On the right is a close up of Colonel Patterson, but there are quite a lot of photographs of him on the internet. You can Google and, uh, and see pictures of him and you'll see the date of the newspaper, February the 5th, 1918. That was the following day after the march. Next, a much poorer photograph uh, of the men doing the wheeling round at the mansion house to march back towards the East End. Next. Now this is the flag of the Judeans. Um, there's a bit of controversy about this. Um, it was probably made in Israel and there is one like it in the Imperial War Museum. Um, there may be another one in Israel at the Avichayel Museum, but it's possibly not on show. But you can see how beautiful and grand it is with the menorah badge and the label Kadima underneath and the label First Judeans. Um, this badge, in fact, wasn't issued until just after the war ended because the Legion wasn't disbanded for about three years after the war. They did garrison duty in Israel. Um, but this badge is very, very rare. Only about 3,000 of them, if that, were made. Um, they had brass ones for the other ranks and bronze for the officers who wore them on their collars. But for most of the war period, from the whole of 1918, from when the regiment left Britain, they wore the badge of the Royal Fusiliers, which was their parent regiment. So there's the lovely banner, blue and white, same colors as the modern Israeli flag. And it says under at the top, Hagadud Hayivri, the uh, Jewish battalions, Rayon the the Hoda, the first, first Judeans. Rayon, Rayon the Yehuda, the first Judeans. And then underneath in English. Okay. And there's an actual uh, Judean uh, Kadima badge, the Hebrew word Kadima. Um, these are, you very, very rarely see these in antique shops and medal fairs, uh, but they are, we have a couple of them at the Ajax Museum. I've got one in my collection. I've seen them in other people's collections. And then they're quite expensive to buy these days if you're in the market for that kind of thing. Yep, next one. Now here's a lovely photograph of Ben-Gurion. And if you look on the top of his 
what is his right shoulder, you would make out a Star of David. Now the, the battalions, there were three battalions, the London battalion, the 38th battalion, wore a red Star of David, and we have one in our collection. The 39th battalion from the United States wore a blue Mug and David, and we have one in our collection as well. They're fairly rare. And the 40th Battalion, who were all raised in Israel and were refugees living in Egypt at the time, that were counters of the Israeli Battalion, their badge was mauve. I've never seen one. And I believe me, I used to go to medal fairs and antique shows looking for them. I've never seen one on sale on, on the internet. If you're going to find one, it's probably among families in Israel who've kept, kept them from their grandfathers and great-grandfathers who served. This photograph, life-size, is in the Royal Fusiliers Museum at the Tower of London, which is the main headquarters of the Royal Fusiliers, uh, with another item I'll show you in a moment. And the Royal Fusiliers are very, very proud of this Jewish link. And they, they in fact, call themselves informally a Jewish regiment. Many Londoners joined the Royal Fusiliers in both world wars because it was a local regiment. Um, so, they're very proud, and if you go to the Royal Fusiliers Museum in the Tower, and I, I urge you to do it, you will see this huge photograph of him. And when I gave a talk there some years ago at the, the 2014, the anniversary of the beginning of the First World War, I was honored to be asked to give the inaugural lecture on this very topic uh, in the officer's mess to a very big and distinguished crowd. And um, we went to see the uh, photograph and the memorial to the to the legion afterwards. Next one. This is a typical identity badge, in this case of a man called Gladstone, and you can see the RF for Royal Fusiliers. You can see his number, though it's upside down, J4143, and the J in the middle for Jewish. So all Jews had J on their ID badge. This is true of the Second World War too. But in the case of the Legion, their number had the prefix J. It's the only regiment in the British Army to have a prefix J, or indeed any prefix at all. In the Second World War, the only Jewish soldiers from Israel who had a different prefix were the Palestinian Jews, and they had the prefix PAL. So you could tell if the man was from, was from Israel. But this is the First World War one. Uh, these are also very collectible, very rare, uh, quite expensive to buy. It's just from my own small collection. J for the Jewish battalions. Next slide. On the side of the medals on the rim in the First World War, the name, rank and number of all the soldiers was recorded. This is why collecting First World War medals or redeeming the Jewish medals is fairly easy to do because you if you have an eyeglass with you, you can look at these identities on the rim. So here we've got J596, private, somebody or other, Morris Cooper, I think it is, um, in my collection. If you see these medals, buy them and donate them to us, please. They get more expensive as years go by. Uh, people collect them and often sell them to Jewish collectors because they know they're looking for the J prefix. So this is J596, he also had the number J560, often the numbers changed, and his name is found in the 40th Battalion uh, in the British Jewry Book of Honour, which lists all the Jews who served in the First World War. Many of you will know this book. If you don't, Google it, British Jewry Book of Honour, and try and buy yourself a copy. It's, uh, it's, it should be in every Jewish home. Next. Now, the Israelis have never been very big on giving medals to their soldiers. Um, they believe in keeping things quite low key. But after Israel was, it became independent, in the late 50s, they began issuing medal ribbons for the various com uh, conflicts in which their soldiers had taken part, taken part. There are medals, only two, for extreme bravery. One of them is called the Medallet Oz, the Medal of Courage. But the one for the Jewish Legion uh, from the First World War 
or the Zion Mule Corps is this little ribbon here. And it wasn't issued until well into the 1970s. And this was followed by ribbons for other conflicts too. Not quite sure, I've never been able to find out what the colors of red, yellow and green stand for, but the Israeli flag is um, of course very obvious. Yep, next one. Now this is um, a very interesting little medallion, which is connected to the Legion, very rare. And some of you may know of the Judea Capita coins, which were minted by the swine who was the Emperor Hadrian, a very cultured and intelligent man who was the, the Hitler of Rome, uh, when he destroyed Israel in the First Revolt, and uh, in the Second Revolt, sorry. And the Judea Capta coins featured a woman sitting on a bench crying, and standing over her, a Roman soldier with a raised sword and the words Judea captured, Judea is defeated, Judea is captured. He did this because uh, he wanted the R Roman Empire inhabitants to know that the Jews had been completely defeated by him. And the reason was twofold. There were no newspapers or radios, and the only way of getting a message to the four corners of the empire was using a coin. This circulated around the Roman world, and people would see it. And the second reason was that the Jews were seen as such a threat to Rome that their defeat was held as a great victory, even though it was a kind of foregone conclusion because the Jewish army was so much smaller than the Roman legions. And the whole idea of the invisible Jewish God so threatened the ideas of Roman culture of their stone gods and their emperors who made themselves God, that they felt that the whole structure of Jewish society and religion was a great threat to them. And they wanted to make it quite clear they defeated them. Um, uh, and at a lecture I went to the, the Israel Exploration Fund at University College some years ago, had a non-Jewish lecturer from Oxford who was an expert on Roman coins. And he said that this was the only time the Romans ever minted a coin when they defeated a nation, and they defeated many nations. It was the only time when they defeated the Jews, uh, when a coin was minted by them. Now, the Jewish people who know their history therefore realize the significance of this. And so when the First World War was over, the Bezalel School of Art in Jerusalem, which is still there, very famous, world famous, in fact, they minted this coin in mockery of the Judea Capta coins. And the image on the right uh, features some Kabbalistic um, symbols. And it says that the men are the Mitnadvim Ba'am Yisrael, volunteers from the land of Israel. But on the other side, the image on the left, this is a mockery of the Roman coin, showing the woman, the people of Israel, rising up and breaking her chains, and the Roman soldier with his sword down, running away. And it says quite clearly in Hebrew underneath, Yehuda mishtacharia, Judea is free. Um, I've got a, one of these, I came across it quite by accident, and bought it, very rare if you see one, uh, buy it. Uh, and give it to a museum that would appreciate it. Um, a very important and significant item in Jewish history. Bezalel, by the way, after whom is named the School of Art in the University of Jerusalem, was the artist who designed the Ark of the Covenant. That's why the Department of Art has been given that name. And the next slide. This is the memorial I mentioned. This once was in the Duke Street Synagogue in Oldgate. It was lost for many years, but was in the storeroom of the Royal Fusiliers and is now on show at the Tower of London. And it says the colors of the 38th Battalion Fusiliers who fought under the British flag for the redemption of the Holy Land in the Great War. 
in English and in Hebrew. Uh, the Jewish Museum in Camden did have that on show for about six months. They borrowed it, uh, but it's now back at the Tower of London where it should be. Finally, the last slide, uh, that's me, very much younger, with a black hair and beard. In 1989, I was invited by the curator of the Royal Fusiliers Museum to attend one of their annual luncheons for First World War veterans. These, of course, have stopped long ago. They've all passed away. And I was introduced to these two guys. On the left, there is Royal Fusilier Sergeant Jack Cohen, who was 92. He was in the 39th Battalion. And on the right, J3310 Private Barney Shadlovsky, who was age 91, who was in the 38th Battalion. Uh, that was one of the last times Jewish veterans of the Legion appeared at the Tower of London at the Royal Fusiliers reunion. So quite a moving occasion for me and um, for the people who were there. It was held in the officers' mess with all the silver of the officers uh, on the tables. Okay, so we're now going to sh look at uh, or listen to a piece of music. Um, this music, and here's a photograph of Jabotinsky in the middle with some of the Legionnaires. You can see they're wearing their desert uniform with shorts. This music was written by Nina Ruth Davis Salomon. Some of you may know that she was a very famous late Victorian Edwardian uh, Jewish feminist and a suffragette. There were quite a few Jewish women suffragettes. And she was the first person to translate the Zionist anthem, which became the Hatikva, into English. But she also wrote this song called The Judeans Marching Song. And it was found quite by accident in July 2014 at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, the sheet music. And they got together a choir and decided to record it. And this is what it sounds like. Sorry, I'm going to have to just play around with something. It's not doing what it should do. So can you just talk a few moments, if that's okay. all right, Martin? Yes, I can do that. I'm always good at talking. Um, the photograph you just saw of Jabotinsky, um, there are photographs like that in the British Jury Book of Honour. If you don't know the book, it's half lists of men from the regiments by name, rank and number, though not all the numbers appear. and. Some of them are in error. There's a big introduction, uh, experiences of the chaplains, nurses, women nurses who served. I'm very, uh, um, I'm quite interested in that aspect of it. And then the second half is photographs, hundreds and hundreds of photographs, all uh, indexed. And you can find, may find relatives of yours if you take a good look at it. And there's a whole section just on the Zion Mule Corps and the Jewish Legion. And I'm pretty certain that famous one of Patterson leading the men through London is included. But of course, you'll find much more on the Jewish Legion and the Zion Mule Corps in Israel. If you don't know, there is a wonderful museum just outside Netanya at Moshav Avichail, very easy to reach by taxi for a couple of miles away. And it's the Museum of the Zion Mule Corps, the Jewish Legion. And in the last 10 years, they added a huge annex uh, for the Jewish Brigade of the Second World War and including the famous Jewish parachutists of SOE from Israel, who parachuted into Nazi-occupied Balkans to help rescue Jews and try and release um, British prisoners who were held in camps there. So Avichail Museum, if you're interested in this kind of thing, is a great place to go. There's also another museum to the Zion Mule Corps and the Shomrim, the early guards of Israel, at uh, Kibbutz in Northern Israel, whose name I always forget. Um, uh, but you can look it up in, in an index of uh, military museums. And of course, they've got the more modern museums at Latrun and uh, Ammunition Hill in Jerusalem, uh, which are to the post-independence wars. But Avichail is a must for you if you're interested in that. And um, there's also, uh, a museum of the Haganah, and I'm not sure whether 
that's been incorporated into the modern Israel Museum, a, a military museum at the Trum. But there used to be a Haganah Museum, which, for example, had um, the uniform, one of the uniforms of Ord Wingate, the famous Zionist British general who trained the special night squads, who were Jewish commandos who went after Arab terrorists in the 1930s. Uh, Isaac Rabin and Moshe Dayan were trained by Wingate. Wingate was a fanatical Zionist, as you know, and sadly he was killed fighting with the Chindits in 1944. So I don't know, Alan, whether you're yes, ready. Yes, I've found it. It's all right. I've sorted that. Well, I have to pause for the other slides as well until I get it sorted out. So just give me a moment and we shall share the screen, which is this one. And there we go. Kabatinsky. Raw Fusiliers there. Zion, our mother, calling to thy sons, we are coming, we are coming to thy name. Spread among the nations, we thy loving ones, we are ready, we are coming unafraid. All along the ages, thou was lying waste, we were waiting, we were looking to the goal. Thou wast always calling, calling us to haste, we were hoping and we heard thee in our soul. In thy sign, we shall prove thee, we shall save thee by our toil. Zion, our mother, now thy sons depart. We are coming while thou watchest there and all. Heart amid the nations, beating with our heart. We are ready, we are coming, we thy own. There you are. The men in civilian clothes in the early photographs, of course, were men who just arrived as recruits uh, before they got their uniforms. The man with all the medals near the end was, of course, Patterson. Some of you will know that he went, he was sent to America by the British government in the Second World War to rally support for the war effort, but he stayed there and died in 1948, just as Israel became independent. And it was only five or six years ago when Benjamin Netanyahu persuaded his American contacts to allow his body of uh, Patterson to be disinterred and brought to Israel. And he's now buried where he wanted to be buried uh, on Mount Herzl with his comrades. Okay, and lastly, we have a film. There are three films that exist about the brigade. The one I'm gonna show the uh, Legion, the one I'm gonna show you, there's another one at the Imperial War Museum which was made by a Spanish uh, film crew, which shows the men at Ed Buckland. Uh, there's a boxing match, there's marching up and down, there are Israeli flags. And this shows them, gives you a good idea of barracks where they were uh, um, posted and where they were trained before they went abroad and before that group came up to London. And then there's a third film uh, also at the Imperial War Museum, which shows some men in uniform, probably near the Tower of London on the day of that march. And you can see Jabotinsky and Jabotinsky, images of Jabotinsky on film are quite rare. They probably got more in Israel, but they're quite rare period. And you can see him standing there surrounded by these other men. And that's obviously a crowd of the Legion men waiting to form up to go on the, on the march, or maybe it was the evening before. I, I, it's hard to tell, but those are the only three films. And this is the one, one I'm going to show you is the one that uh, I think is the best of the three.
when you're ready, Alan. One moment, I've just found it. I've just said there was a bit. Good. Just to confirm, there is no sound with this. Yes, this is a silent film, quite right. So here you see, there's the London open top buses. There's Patterson. There's the man in the great coat who's in the photograph. There they go with their fixed bayonets and the crowd marching along with them. This is probably in Aldgate High Street. There were nearly 500 of them. This is a Pathé News film, as you see. See, the crowd is quite big at the back there, three or four deep on the pavement. I wonder where the old woman is saying that she's got the only son marching in, in time. Oh no, she's not there. At the back, you'll see the required ambulance, only this time it's uh, pulled by horses. In case anyone passes out. Here's the band of the Coldstream Guards. This appears to be near the tower, but it's hard to tell. Here's Patterson talking to one of his officers. This is at the Pavilion Theatre where um, Patterson was asked to dismount and meet the dignitaries, the mayors, the councillors, some people from the Jewish community, who's who, I don't know, the guy with the top hat, looks to be like somebody. And here they are again. Marching back towards the tower. Patterson again. For some reason, another shot of the theatre. See the word Sion in the Mug and David up there on the flag. There you go. Finally, to finish, just one very short remark. Um, I saw on a war memorial near South End, actually, many years ago, this quote from the first book of Samuel, Shmuel Echad, Suk Sheshestre, verse 16. Huma hayu aleinu gam laila gam yuman. They were a wall around us by night and by day. That's how I think of the Zion Mule Corps and the Jewish Legion, because from them directly comes the line to the Haganah and the other resistance groups and the Israel Defense Forces. Thank you for listening, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Martin. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we have a couple of questions. If anybody has a question for Martin, please type it into the Q&A now uh, so that uh, we can put that across in the few minutes we have uh, left. One of our viewers would like you to repeat the name of the museum near Netanya. Right, that's called Avi Chayil, my father the soldier in Hebrew. And it was established by the veterans of the 40th Battalion with some from America. Uh, as a Moshav, and they built a museum very early on in the 1920s. They've gathered in the most astonishing material, biographies, photographs, artifacts, and as I said, they've continued up to the end of the Second World War, and it's just outside Netanya. Any taxi driver will take you there. Now, Emma Tate, uh, whose grandfather was in the 39th Battalion, 
uh, born in Newcastle. Uh, she asks, did the 39th Battalion march through the East End? No, it was the 38th, half of the 38th Battalion only. The 39th would have been down in Plymouth and I'm not even sure when they went abroad. They may have gone with the 38th or, or later on, but they certainly did go and they, they did take part in the fighting bef well before the end of the war in the Jordan Valley with the Anzac soldiers, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. Uh, Fee Tablet also uh, had uh, her father uh, volunteered to serve in the Jewish Brigade. He, uh, uh, she says many soldiers were members of the Oxford and St George's Jewish Youth Club in the East End and wonders, did all the soldiers speak English or only Yiddish? No, um, let's, let's, there's a bit of a mix up there. The Oxford and St George Club was formed between the wars and the volunteers from that club went to fight in the Second World War. Uh, as for the Legion and their language, it is true that many of these men had been born in Russia, but were brought up in London, and they spoke English with a broken accent, but they also spoke Yiddish at home. And others were pure Cockneys who had been born in London and been living with their families since the 1870s and 80s uh, and would describe themselves as English Jews. But there was a whole mixture of people. Um, we have a question from Franklin Davis who asks, where is the Ajax Museum? Uh, my heart is broken. Um, the Ajax Museum moved to Hendon and we had a wonderful display, but the rent was so high, they had to close not long before the, uh, well, this was back in about 2012, 13, I think, 14, they had to close. And they went and joined in with the Camden Jewish Museum. But we were given space for some of the artifacts and a room where we could store the rest and have our archives and people could come and do research like me. However, the building that was in opposite the Camden Museum wasn't owned by Ort. Ort was the organization that rented it. And the owners sold it and we had to go and the most of the archive is now in deep storage somewhere in London. I don't even know where it is. So and if any, anybody has a building to make available to you. Um, what we need is two million pounds, one to buy a building and one million pounds as a fund, which will pay a permanent curator to be on duty there. Yes, but we, that we couldn't find the money. I unfortunately had very little to say about it. I'm a small cog in the will even though I'm the archivist, and that's where we are. It's very, very sad. Uh, finally, we have a comment from Lily Baker. Men from Leeds were in the 38th Battalion, including my grandfather, the regimental cook. Oh, wonderful. He had a very important job. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Martin, thank you so much for being our guest this evening. Uh, Martin's various books are available on Amazon and from other good booksellers uh, if you wish. Those uh, of you in Leeds might be interested to know there is a copy of the Book of Honour at the UHC Synagogue, uh, which is available for people to look at should they wish. There are probably other copies uh, around and about. Now, to say thank you to you, uh, we'd like to send you a book of some of my photographs. <laughs> this is uh, Mug and David Adom. This is uh, oh, yes, yeah. the Israeli Ambulance Service in, in action. So hopefully you'll uh, You'll enjoy that. Now, just before we leave you a few words about our upcoming programme, we're off next week due to Shavuot, but we're back on the 13th of June with the Holocaust survivor, Dr. Agnes Kaposi. Uh, we'll be discussing her experiences growing up in Hungary uh, and her dramatic escape uh, to the UK in 1957. The following week, the musician Ben Sidran is speaking about his book, There Was a Fire, Jews, Music and the American Dream. We have many more speakers booked later into the year. We have a very exciting programme coming up. So please do visit our website at milim.org.uk. Sign up to our newsletter 
and make sure you don't miss anything. You can get tickets for events there. They're all free, but you can make a donation if you want to help with the costs of putting on these events. There's a link in the chat now or uh, look at our website or the follow up email you'll get tomorrow. It remains for me to thank our guest, Martin Shukerman. Once again, thank you so much, Martin. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here and congratulations on one, uh, running such a fantastic organisation up there. You're very kind. Looking forward to seeing you all at a future event. And until then, stay safe. See you soon. Bye-bye.